Rainier Valley Historical Society's mission is to collect, preserve, exhibit, and interpret the history and heritage of Rainier Valley and its people, and to promote public involvement in and appreciation of its history and culture. Our geographic boundaries are from Dearborn Street to the city limits and from I-5 to Lake Washington. Our office is located at 3710 South Ferdinand Street in the Columbia City neighborhood of Seattle. Yeah. A long time. <laughs> and this is That's actually happening. That's great. All right, so um, so you're Joseph Barker. This is just for the tape. And um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your family background? You were starting to tell me you're from Illinois. Yeah, uh, I'm from Illinois, and uh, from a town called Collinsville. Uh -huh. And uh, it's a little town about 15 minutes from St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. And a uh, uh, beautiful place to live, I think. Uh, we moved to Seattle in 1971. I came out of it with my mother. She loaded up a car and just started driving. And then we ended up in Seattle. I think somebody told uh, my mom's side of the family it was gold up here or something. Because <laughs> the whole family in a few years really migrated out here. Oh, okay. So, is it anything in particular? Well, um, you'd like to hear also. Well, I mean, and just a little bit about your. Well, I have uh, like how many sisters? Bro, I got about. I have about uh, four sisters and one brother. Uh, all my sisters live pretty close to right here, and, okay. and uh, I have one in Skyway, one at right at the bottom of the hill in Renton, and one in the Renton Highlands, kind of. So did y'all end up here when you first moved? Well, yeah, I told you, Mom loaded up the car, and we we didn't stay here at first. At first, I think we started in the central area across the street from Gay's Bakery. Okay. And then uh, uh, I remember uh, my older sister uh, ended up meeting a, a guy, and she started living with him. <laughs> and then uh, the rest of us, we moved to Redmond. Oh, okay. And uh, so I went to Garfield. I moved out to Redmond. You know, as a basketball, you know, going to be Michael Jordan or Dr. J in those days. <laughs> and uh, then the, to Auburn. Oh, wow. And uh, I got the MVP trophy out there. Oh, right. on tape. Okay. Then I ended up graduating at San Diego High, if you can imagine that. San Diego, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have things where I was living with mom. She was on the go, so. Oh, wow. And um, I ended up coming back to Seattle. Uh, after my first year of junior college at San Diego City College, got up here and I, I kind of lost that basketball dream. Got, I got kind of hungry down there, you know, living on my own. So um, I came up. I ended up working at the Olympic Hotel. Actually, it was my first job, you might say, in the in the industry. Mm -hmm. They hired me at uh, a guy named Chuck Bochamp hired me as the in the steward department at the Olympic Hotel, and actually I ended up being a professional pot and pan washer. <laughs> I can remember working there, uh, doing shifts where it'd be so many dishes and pots and pans. I'd work for eight hours, right? And uh, Chuck would come in and say, hey, "Give me a key." He say, "He say, Joe, I want you to go up into room 312 or." And uh, try to get a couple hours of sleep, and you know I'll come up there and get you. We got a whole bunch of some big events going on, and, and uh, we need you to stick. Oh, I would say, well, you know, man, you can't. I don't want to stick around for now. I gotta go home already. And put in my. He said, I know, I know. So going up there, and uh, I'll wake you up. Right? I don't want to he would say, get out of here, right? Because you know that's just his first time. I said, I need to make. He said, the room has keys, so start sleeping. Cause I'm gonna be coming to get you in about four hours, wow. like that. In a, <laughs> like an ER or something. Right, and, and, and I was making, uh, I think I was making two dollars and thirty cent an hour. Wow. And, and they, what, what year was this? This year? was this wasn't that long ago. Well, I guess it was about 1974. Okay. And uh, I got a I got a five cent an hour raise. I was big time. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So that was your first kitchen. Yeah, but, but actually my mom was a chef, so okay. everywhere we went, 
She cooked. She cooked at the uh, in Seattle. She cooked at the uh, at Fishman Wharf. She had a good job out there. She did cold food out there. She did cold food in the Space Needle. Cold food. You know the Gourmet J department. You know the salads and uh, all the cold, cold food there. more. Yeah, she, I, I believe she was. Even though I've been to school and been cooking since about uh, seventy six. Um, I don't know if I'm good at cooking shit, but she really <laughs> Where did she learn? Okay. It's just, I, th I think from just doing it, really, and then working in the restaurants and stuff. Mm -hmm. She didn't really go to, to school for it, but man, you could ask anybody who knows her. Yeah. Yeah, she just, from doing it, and she really enjoyed doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she would do spreads at our house, like for Thanksgiving. You know, everybody was coming to our house. Right, right. And um, she would do the turkey and dressing and the sweet potato pies. And uh, this is an example of what she did. She would do the, uh, of course, the pineapple upside down cake. Mm -hmm. And she would do like a big German chocolate cake. And she'd do a potato salad and, and, and candy yams and all that. But she would also do dishes like lobster thermidor. Oh, yeah. She'd do all kind of jello molds. She liked, she really liked working with. That aspic and jello. Uh, she did oysters, a coma, all, I mean, just dishes you. Wow. You know, normally, you know, you wouldn't ever hear about. It. I really didn't know what to think of them in myself. <laughs> I did, wow, you know, we did what yeah. it was eating. So, yeah. and. Uh, so, um, do you do you cook some of the dishes she made? Did you learn separately? You know, like now I can, like you know, I can cook whatever, pretty much whatever now, but. Um, I, re I like lobster thermidor and stuff. I've worked in restaurants where I've had to cook some of those dishes earlier in my career. I worked a lot of restaurants. And um, I think I went from there to Bethlehem Steel. Got a better job. You know, I was making probably gross in about 800 a month. You know, I was so big time. Mm -hmm. And you know where your the historical society is, right? Mm -hmm. My first apartment was in the Columbia Arms, right next to the, where is that right now? Oh, yeah. That apartment yeah. there, that yeah. Building. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. So. So when you were living there, that was the early 70s? Yeah, that was about, I moved there in 74. Okay. So that was about, was that kind of in the middle of a time when lots of African Americans were moving into the neighborhood? Do you remember when? I it, think so. When I moved into that apartment, when I was there, it really wasn't that many um, African Americans out that far south, to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. Yeah. Even though you would, it'd be kind of hard to imagine that now. But um, I had a manager there. Her name was Miss Schultz. She was a German lady, older German lady. Mm -hmm. she, was, she rented me a furnished apartment. And, I mean, it gave me dishes, and oh. because I didn't know nothing about that. When I went to linen, I didn't. I had a blanket, you know. <laughs> and um, and for and I think I was 19 then, so uh, she really took good care of me. I don't know how I would have made it without that woman. <laughs> she was so nice. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as far as uh, I think. Uh, that was about it, really, that distance. It, black people wasn't out too much. There were some, you know, more affluent. Mm -hmm. uh, I can think it, because just think about where that, um, where is it, the uh, uh, Empire Way apartments, or MLK apartments are on Martin Luther King Town, just a little farther. Okay. It's a big complex, it right. looks like, right next to uh, uh, the shopping center right there. Mm -hmm. but. That there was not, there was no black people out that far. That when I when I used to go there in '74, it was like uh, you'd hear stewardesses and, and pilots and everybody lived out. You know, it was like boom, it was really plush. You uh -huh, know, yeah. I think one of the guys who worked for the radio station lived out there, uh, mm -hmm. a black man from KRIC, mm -hmm. KRIC Cats, but and, and, and you know, in time. So where are we? Oh, <laughs> well, I'm just I'm just curious okay, now, if you don't mind talking it. about it a little bit about um, you know did you feel like people were worried about African Americans moving in? You know, I was pretty young, and uh, like I said, since I really believe 
Uh, when I first went to Garfield, you know, a few years back and all of that stuff, I, it was a time coming out of the 60s. You know, there's a bunch of strife going on. I seen some pretty bad stuff. I don't really want to go in there. People fighting and throwing rocks at each other and all that stuff. But I think I was for, I was fortunate because I think because of my aspirations to play sports, I just was treated better. Mm. <laughs> Period. I mean, uh, when I went to Redmond, right? I, when I went to Redmond High. I think it was three black people out there. It was uh, myself, a gentleman named John, and then uh, it was another young man. I uh, ended up owning a store and said, what was his name? Cliff, I think it was. So he's doing pretty good now. And that was it in the entire school, right? Mm -hmm. And um, for the most part, I didn't have any problems, but Redmond then was not Redmond like now. Redmond then was a real little spot. And, mm -hmm. You know, it was all woods, and I, I remember we, and it don't even seem like that long ago when I think about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can remember waiting at the bus stop to go to school, and it'd be a brown, it'd be a bear over there. Like you'd see a brown bear. <laughs> it, what is that over there? And the you know, we can't go over there, right? So the bus would come see us and come where we were at, you know. Because the, the way in the yeah, woods, it was all woods out there. Yeah, I was uh, I was so shocked. I, I read the the big, ch huge, huge, gigantic yeah. change. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. So um, I I didn't feel, but so you know, it was a couple athlete. other guys. You know, it was a couple other guys out there with the cowboy boots and hat that was chewing, always chewing something. Spit, you know, them guys. You know, I kind of gave them a little wide berth. You yeah. know, because yeah. you know, I you know, for one. They really didn't like it. It was a conflict with, you know, like women, because I, I didn't have any problem. I liked you know, pretty much everybody, you know, right. and, the, and the girls out there were sure looked certainly beautiful. And playing sports, you know, I attracted a bunch of attention from them. And uh, there's a couple of situations, you know, where I get put in the best of maybe I got to get out of here yeah, yeah. kind of thing. And then um, from there I moved to uh, Auburn. And it was pretty much the same situation out at Auburn High. It was it was uh, about three black people in the school. Mm -hmm. One of them is still my best friend, right? Give him some play, Robert Kenzie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, and we still work together. Oh, you do. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's always been some kind of tension um, between races, but I, I truly believe it's. It's, you can I don't. I mean, everybody can't get through it. I don't think the way I did. My attitude, and I think just moving around with my mother taught me how to meet people pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Then I was driven, sports related, really driven. So I, I could get along with anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. pretty much mm -hmm. I could get along with you. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not offended by you. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, today I still have that quality. And um, I, I think it's been a great asset to me. Yeah. Another, another person don't offend me. Yeah. They can be whoever they are, that's fine. Well, that's great. So. so that, when you moved to Columbia City, that attitude. Yeah, that was, that, was after, that was after all that Auburn and San Diego High. I lived in San Diego. It was a much one-third black, one-third white, one-third Mexican. Uh -huh. You know, so many, you know, it's right close to Mexico. Beautiful experience there. Then I moved back to Seattle, and like I said, worked at the Olympic Hotel to um, to uh, Bethlehem Steel. And then I ended up getting laid off probably early uh, '75, and ended up selling cookware door to door. If you can believe it, yeah, yeah. I sold cookware for a year door to door, knocking on everybody's door. Wow! It was so much fun, and. Uh, I did that, you know, and then I started, you know, I was probably 20, 21, I started having a lot of fun knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. I, had to, I started having, you know, meeting a lot of nice people and stuff, but I wasn't selling so much at the end, so I ended up joining the Marines. Oh, really? You know, my country was looking for me. Uh -huh. And, uh, of course, uh, I'm not mentioning this, uh, well, I ended up getting married after I joined the Marines to, uh, uh, actually, my high school sweetheart from San Diego. Oh, yeah. Okay, because I was that sent me that sent me back to San Diego when I joined the Marines, yeah. and uh, so.
So and while I was in there, I wasn't a cook, even though, um, even though I, I when, when I was in the military, I was in communications. And uh, but on the weekend, I kind of worked at a Seven Eleven, kind of moonlight mm -hmm. for just about the entire time. I was in San Clemente, California, for five years. I ended up. Uh, Two or three years there, that it was so nice. Orange County, right there on the beach, you know. Yeah, yeah. I hated to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but working on this this job is moonlighting. Uh, it was a guy would come in every night. I'd work from eleven to graveyard shift, eleven to seven. It was this guy who'd come in and just order seven up, those big leaders of seven up, four or five of, and. Uh, he started coming in, he'd talk, you know, he'd talk an hour, half hour, just hanging there with me, you know, nobody else around. Right. And uh, come to find out he was the chef of a restaurant called The Anchor Inn, which was right next door. Oh, wow. Right, and we became real good friends, right? And so when I got to service, I continued uh, my friendship with him. And one fourth of July, I get a call from him, and uh, he says, Joe, what are you doing? Could you come down here? He said, my cooks are drunk, and I got a really big day coming, I don't have any. I said, well, man, I really haven't, you know, I'm really not cooking, you know. <laughs> I mean, I got stuff, I'm probably going to be drunk myself, but it's the 4th of July, right? He said, he said, man, just come down. And I said, man, I can't do it. I was trying to get, he said, you, you, you come down here. <laughs> kind of, uh -huh. and I could tell he really needed me to come down there, so I go down. And he'd get me in the kitchen and we, you know, put an old chef jacket on me in the apron. <laughs> and we're moving around. He said, look, I'm going to show you this stuff. I don't have a bunch of time to tell you, but you can follow some orders, can't you? And he'd always ask me questions like that. You, you can at least follow orders. I said, man, of course I can do it. What's wrong with you, right? And he'd say, well, just for the captain's plate, they get two pieces of fish like this. You just drop it in. You put it in here and then put it in the bread and then drop it in. And and you could do it, right? Like that, to do it. Good. I said, like that? He said, no, like this, right? He said, I thought you could do it. I said, I can do this, bro. <laughs> and I mean, we went around and around the whole day. It seemed like he was, he would always say, you can at least do that. I know you can do that, man. And then and then all the time he showed me how to set the plate, something just worked, kind of setting him up and, and picking up around him. Uh -huh. And uh, I mean, we went the whole night like that. And uh, when it was over, he, he asked me, he said, Joe, he said, man, you really did good, man. We just the most of we ever served here. And he said, man, if you want a job, I'm going to hire you tonight. Those other guys are fired. <laughs> and uh, I had just got to tell you the truth. I had just got this service. I wanted to just collect unemployment, right? right. I was going to go to real estate school and, and all of that stuff. So I told him, no, man, no. And uh, But... Uh, uh, like I said, I went and talked to my wife. She said, you better take that job. <laughs> I went down there and he said, this is $5 an hour. And what? this is 79, I think I'm up to 79. And, um, and so we, I worked there for a year. And um, he showed me a lot. It's a seafood house right on the water. And I mean, he showed me how to cut steaks out, how to cook and all fillet fish. He, you know, it was little neck clams. He'd get them from the East Coast and, and scallops, abalone. I mean, really a lot of, even today in a lot of the places I've worked since then, they haven't cooked the same menu like that. Yeah. And uh, in one year I went from being able to not do anything, I could cook anything on that menu. I mean, really yeah. cook it. But if you would have took me out of there, put me in another restaurant, I wouldn't have been able to cook anything. <laughs> I didn't have no confidence. Oh, really? But but this young man, his name was Ed Amaral. He really inspired me. He uh -huh. told me, man, Joe, you're good. You could do this. You could do that. He gave me the Escoffier cookbook. He gave me my first set of knives. I still have this, oh, okay. at least one or two of them. And. Um, he just said, you know, Las Vegas, he opened up some books, he'd get articles and show me, look at these chefs in Las Vegas, how much money they're making them doing. <laughs> he said, man, you really should go for it. And, you know, and he really did, he really, really inspired me and I, to uh, do it. Even though my mom was a chef, I really didn't, uh, I, I didn't really consider it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... 
from there, you know, I, he told me, man, uh, I got a friend over at the uh, Dana Park Yacht Club. He was looking for some help, man. He'll pay you so much if you want to go over there a couple of days. So I started going over there. And then it was another old chef would come in and eat in our restaurant. And um, he had a restaurant really close to where we were, too. It was a dinner playhouse mm -hmm. called Sebastian's West. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me, well, he tried to steal me out. He said, well, if you ever looking for a job, Joe, you know, he'd always tell me, you ever looking for a real job, right? <laughs> and, and then, you know, and they was there, man, get on out of here, run him out of there, right? But it was a real, a, a nice little community atmosphere. Mm -hmm. He'd come in, he's a chef, he'd come in the back door and walk through the kitchen and rest. Everybody didn't go sit in the bar and have a couple of drinks, right? <laughs> then he'd walk back out and go back over to his place, right? <laughs> And so, uh, Ed decided he was moving back home, and he's from Martha's Vineyard. Oh, really? Okay. So, so he trains me and sets me up to be the chef, right? Of course, me and him was all straight with it, but the owners, you know, oh. they, they really didn't feel that comfortable. They loved the way I could cook. They knew I could do it. Yeah, you know, they let, in a week I was there for a week around the place and everything. But like I said, it would be nothing new, never. Mm -hmm. And they hired a, another older chef who could come in and do things and, uh, and had me training him right oh, weird. <laughs> on the way I was doing it. But he kind of wanted to do it his way anyway. So I kind of eased across the street and talked to to. Uh, the shovel across the street, and he said, well, man, yeah, if you want to come, we can do it. So I gave him my notice and everything, and I think it was probably better, because I was, I was kind of salty. I wanted to be the chef really bad, yeah. and uh, but now I look back, I see they just couldn't. It was too big a business to trust me, unless it would have been some kind of added learning. But, you know, I have no experience, really one year experience. It was too big a position, even though uh, I could handle it, you know, if anything would have changed. So I go to the next place, right? And it's called Sebastian's West. Like I said, it's a dinner playhouse. And uh, the meal we cooked every day was called The Feast. Mm, okay. And um, and uh, this is where I started doing buffets, really. And so, you know, at first I'm in there, I'm, he had me cooking the fish and cutting up fish and the salad, helping with the salads. And, and some of the things, because each meal we would do like four or five salads, a beef julienne salad, we'd do this marinated vegetable salad, this huge toss green salad, and then um, and then he would always have kind of a, he'd do a pasta, more like with a creamy Italian kind of a salad dressing, and then we'd cook these barons of beef, right? We do this, you know, with the big bone in it. It was just this piece of the, the cow right, right, right and just right. cut out and just stuck in the oven. And yeah. each each night we're feeding like 300 people. We'd set up wow. two buffets on stage, right? Because it's a dinner playhouse, and we were in the in the in their uh, menu or their book. We would be like Act Two, Act One. They would come in and they and they'd build it up. You sit down and have cocktails, and the cocktail waitress sits you down. They have, a, they have a table like this, a big aisle, real wide. You have a table like this, and then you're facing the stage, right? Okay. So, and then we're down on stage, Act Two. We're setting up these bars, these uh, buffets, the cold, hot and cold tables just roll around on wheels, and uh, they're completely mobile, right? And we're <laughs> clowning, and we have the highest hats in the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, I mean, we had the long neckerchief, you know, I mean, really long, way down the high hats. We were really... So you are really part of the we show. We were a part of the show, you know, and so we did that. And then we'd come out and slice the roast with the big knives, and the, the old chef was really good, you know. He had clown around with them all, you know, I learned so much from him also. Just showmanship, yeah, kind yeah. of, really showmanship. <laughs> Because we'd work, and then right before we go back out on stage, we'd all change and get really cleaned up and go on stage. And, you know, I mean, he'd climb with it, but he'd get down to the last one. He'd take that whole big bone and put on somebody's plate. Just give him a whole bunch, right? He'd always <laughs> he'd say, give her a whole bunch, right? And it'd be like this tiny person. You can tell she don't even want anything on her plate. 
he put that big bone on her and she would die. And then he'd take a, he'd have a waiter come back and wrap it up and let her take it home with her, right? <laughs> you get rid of, you know, it just was, and, and if you're not really in the, the food business, you know, you don't see big chunks of bones and stuff, right? right? You right. just don't see it. Yeah. And so I worked there probably a year also. And uh, I ended up coming back to Seattle after that. My mother got sick, that's what happened. I came back to Seattle. And um, I ended up working. I ended up going to school uh, because I had the GI Bill. Oh, okay. And so I went to Seattle Central. And, uh, for cooking. For cooking, the culinary arts school. Yeah, like you're the second kinda, person I've talked to from there. <laughs> yeah, I like the old chef was who told me. He uh -huh. kind of inspired me, so, you know, I said, uh -huh. well, I'll do that. And I came up here and uh, I went through, and uh, this is up to 81, about in 81, 80, 81 I started. Mm -hmm. And uh, I graduated, it was a great school. Uh, Melvin Fortson was one of my, was my chef. Mm -hmm. I like to identify with. And then uh, uh, Mr. Blaisdell, also Richard Blaisdell, who was a culinary artist. Mm -hmm. He took us to a uh, culinary competition, and you know I got to work with ice carvings and tallow molds and what? chocolate and butter <laughs> and car. You know he really was it. He was an artist, yeah. and so uh, uh, I think we really benefited my class from that. Hey, we didn't oh, no yeah. tea. I forgot all about it. <laughs> Me too. I'm I'm, I'm working. <laughs> well, it's not too hot. <laughs> and it's probably really strong. Yeah, yeah I'm just talking yeah, about that stuff. Sure, of whatever ills we have. Yeah, you know, uh, just talking about that stuff is pretty, it's pretty good that yeah. you go reflect back like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's really interesting. So, do you do some of that? Um, uh, you know. I did. I did some. I did an ice carving for a group called Ice House, right? I made a, the name of the group was Ice House. They were having a grand opening. It's been a couple of years though, and then uh, I carved this castle for Ice House, and it went on their album cover. Oh, that's so Get cool. out of here! It was so deep, <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. I wish I had a picture. I don't. I, yeah, I might have it downstairs with all the albums. So cool. It, just, it was deep, <laughs> but I didn't even consider it. When they asked me, I said, oh, yeah, no problem. And uh, while I was going to school, uh, for one, once the first summer I sold cars at, at Central Pontiac, which was right across the street from Seattle Central. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for the two months in the summer. And I was the top seller of both, for really, because uh, when I sold cookware, a young man I trained to sell that cookware had become general manager. He stayed in sales. He was the general manager. And he, Tracy Dumman, he just saw me one day and just grabbed me. He's a big, he's a giant man. You know, he's probably, he was 6'6", six, six, and probably about 4'25", so he's just gigantic. Big, he looked like, I always called him a giant leprechaun because he was always smiling, right? And, um... Uh, he hired me there. He said, Joe, oh, you're going to be my gonna be my top sales. But I said, well, man, I said, I'm going to school. He said, no, no, man, come on over here. I'm going to show you how to make some money, man. He said, he said, we only got about three or four months we're going to be here. And he said, man, I want you to get rid of all these cars for me. Right? I want you to sell them. He said, you can do it. He said, I tell you what, go get bonded and come right back. So he gave me some paper. I went downtown, got bonded. I came back. He, I rode out there in a brand new car. I mean, this is like a four-hour thing. He just gave me a demo of a brand new J2000, Pontiac J2000. So, man, I go over this new car. I was like, man, I'm rolling. And I sold so many cars the first month. I think I made uh, $3,500 the first month and then like 22 and for You know, I made a whole lot of money. And so I was really tempted to keep. He said, man, he was moving. The, he was buying the dealership. 
and if you out of, he said, man, why don't you come with me, man? Just come up to me. I said, oh, man, I'm going to school, man. I'm going. I just had to hold on to it because mm -hmm. yeah, I really didn't believe I could sell up any cars that long. I said, it's just, well, you know, it's, things just happen like that, right? So uh, I ended up staying in school and graduating. But while I was in school, I ended up working for Helen's Diner, uh, who is a... I got an article on Helen. Where did I put that article? Where was where's Helen's Diner? Helen's Diner is now in the central area. This is the, this was one of the older um, soul food restaurants, and uh, I'm gonna give you a copy of her. She was uh, right on uh, Union and Twenty Third Union. Okay, I've seen it. It says soul food on there. Yeah, but she was she wasn't there then. Okay. It's, right now that place. You know where Thompson's is, Thompson's point of view? It's, it's still on 23rd and Union behind Philly Best, kind of. Okay, okay. Kind of block, yeah, almost yeah. half a block back. That's where she was at in there. Okay. And uh, she had people from any black, especially black people. In the daytime, she fed uh, more of a white crowd, the police and everybody, they would come in there and eat because. But in the evening, she would do, uh, she'd have live jazz in there. and. Um, and I'd come in and cook. She would kind of cook everything in the day, right? I'd dish up and fry, cook. I'd cook liver and onion, fried catfish and red snapper and all kind of burgers, Mount St. Helen burgers and things mm -hmm. like that while I was going to school. What's a Mount St. Helen's burger? It's, if I told you, you wouldn't believe it was so much on a hamburger. Tell me. It would, <laughs> I would take, I would take the, uh, the bun and I'd put, it's a, it was a, in fact, I'm just reaching in. The, I just have a refrigerator, right? I'm just reaching in the refrigerator, grabbing a hamburger. Oh, <laughs> this, wow. and I'd season it up. That's my special season up. You know, I'd weigh it up. I'd get the right weight. It's probably about a little more than a quarter pounder, mm -hmm. right? And I'd season it up, smash it out, put it on. Then I would grill the bun with mayonnaise on it. Mm -hmm. Then I'd have lettuce, tomatoes, and onions on it. And then I would do it. I'd have one egg, I'd cook over easy. Okay. And then have, let's see, how would I build that thing? I'd, I'd put the hamburger on there. I'd put, I'd put two strips of bacon on there, or the hamburger and cheese, two strips of bacon, a hot link, no, the egg, a hot link. Mm -hmm. I'd cook the egg just enough so everything cooked. But if you cut it a little bit of just, a uh, little bit of yoga run, right? Right, right. And I, so it had a hot link, the bacon, the hamburger, the egg, and be stacked up like that, and I'd cut it and serve it like that with the potato chips or whatever they were behind it. Wow. It was so huge. Wow. I mean, it just was like, but, it, but you know, she was famous for that yeah. because it was right after Mount St. Helens, he well, loved right. it, right? <laughs> wow. It was so funny. That's cool. And, uh, so, I worked for Helen for, you know, I don't know, maybe a year. And then a, a friend of mine was doing catering. And so I'd go down there, and they had a chef called Costa Lazaretti was the chef. And um, he would pretty much tell us what to do, and we'd go in there and just hammer it out. You know, I'm going through school also, so, you know, I'm... And then I, I, I was pretty. I felt pretty comfortable in the kitchen by yeah, now. Yeah, right? I think. And so we could really. They would have a big job, 500, 600. We'd get in there, cook the food, and set it up. I mean, really physical, a lot of physical stuff. And uh, and we did jobs all over. But they had a big room there. Most of them were there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then so uh, this guy, chef, uh, his name is David Watson. He's also an instructor at North right now. Okay. Um, we decided we were going to go into business. Right. And um, so, you know, we worked there and everything, and eventually we, we get out of school. I'm going to have to take that down. <laughs> and um, Make it taken down for you. <laughs> yeah, because it's not, it's not a nail to anything. And so, uh, eventually we do get out of school. Uh, but while we were at school, um, the people from the Western Hotel came up. Uh -huh. 
And uh, they were came in and we, you know, we served food in the dining room at oh, school. Okay. I was doing table side. We were in the table side area, and we served. I think I cooked one guy liver and onions at the table side he ordered. Uh -huh. It's so funny. And his name was Charles O'Neill, and he was the banquet manager. And he gave me his card. He said, "Man, well, if you ever need a job, <laughs> you know, come on down there." And so. So he was kind of scouting. Yeah, they're coming through the colleges, you know. Yeah. And so we we go down there, and, and uh, my buddy was really good. He was like 4.0 all, all the way through. He was really, he was just was just, just immaculate <laughs> in paper and cooking. He was he was really good. He had built this portfolio, and it had his food pictures. Him and his future wife was working on it there, right? Oh, wow. She was a friend of photography class. And, Man, I was, we were in the culinary art class, so they built this portfolio. So he goes down there, and so boom, he's hired into the kitchen, right? And uh, Charles O'Neill trying to hire me for a banquet, assistant banquet manager, right? Mm -hmm. And it's everything going. I get through two interviews. I'm, I'm coming down to get the job. Before I get out of the house, the day he called me and told me, man, just come on there. He want to talk to me, but this has been a change, right? They had somebody from my uh, uh, inner company transfer or something. They thought somehow they got the job and he was apologizing and everything. But he said, uh, he already talked to a guy in the steward department, Chuck Bochamp. I was like, oh no, so I'm back in the steward department, right? And he said he was so happy to see him and everything. He said, do this. I said, but Chuck, I want you to know. I love working with you, but I'm going to school to be a chef. I'm going to be in the kitchen. He, he said, well, he said, well, I don't know if I can get you in here. He said, and he got, he said, I really need help because they were trying to open the second tower at the Westin. Uh -huh. And then he said, I told him, well, you know, I might just can't do it. He said, well, if you stay through till we get this tower open, which took him about two or three months, he said, I talked to the chef when we get you in the kitchen, right? So I did it. It's a lot of work and good times and everything. But he got me in the kitchen, but I went in as assistant pantry person right at the bottom, oh, right? No. <laughs> right. And then uh and but you know, I was really I felt I was really good with with all knife skills and you know, I I felt really good and strong in the kitchen, you know. I've had experience and I went to school and I've cooked. Right. And so it it didn't make any difference, right? I said if I get in there I go I'll blaze. Right, they'll know. And so I get in there, and they put me in the pantry. I have this, I mean, in the, yeah, in the pantry area. I'm working in the cold food under uh, the head guy over there, the gourmet Jay. And he comes in, he's he got like six cases of lettuce over there. You know, I don't know, 50 pounds of carriage, right? It's just celery. It's, it looks like, you know, just, uh, just a trouble over work. Right. And he said, Joe, I want you to do this. Oh, can you know how to peel the ratchet? He'd get one. He put this, I want all of them. This is how I want you to do the carrot. He'd get one carrot. <laughs> this is how I want you to do it. Do one head left. This is how you can do it, right? And he said, this is what we do every day. Oh, no. And uh, which wasn't the truth. I think he was just trying me. And uh, so I said, okay. And uh, so I get in there and, I, you know, my chef knife, I like to use this. I had this, I got this Hinko cleaver. Actually, I don't have it anymore, but kind of got gang, but I, I did then. And, you know, I felt like I could cut through the world with it. It mm -hmm. was that good a knife. Uh, we became one, really. Yeah. So I'm in there blazing through this stuff. I mean, it's noisy because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tack it with ferocity. I mean, really, right, if you right. could have even been there. Yeah. And, and peeling carrots and do all that, get all that work done. It, take, it takes me to do that work the first day. It takes me about four or five hours. Oh, and he comes in, he says, well, man, you did a good job. But it took you all day, so, you know, I work on it. And then I get it down where I can do a bunch and prep and pay attention to what I'm doing, peel the day, you know what I mean, and get yeah. peeled enough for three days maybe the day, and then cut, you know, and then so I get it down to where it's like I'm in there, it might take me two hours then, right? And then yeah. they start moving me, okay, the room service, if you, you know, I'm in the main kitchen, right? And they say, well, if the room service order coming, Joe, why don't you cook it? You know, I'm just sure, you know, so I'm, <laughs> I'm doing room service and um, and uh, for dish up, any big parties come in, they need hands. They take me and we put the food on the plates for the big parties 
And then so I'm doing that, and pretty soon they move me around, letting me cook in the kitchen in those big steam kettles. I mean, they had beautiful equipment. And then people start going on vacation, you know, put me back in the butcher department. Uh -huh. I got to cut meat for about a month and uh, all kind of stuff. I mean, it just was a gigantic amount of uh, experience for me. Yeah. But I still wasn't making, I was making five seventy-five an hour. And then at lunch, they start having me go to the Palm Court, right? Go up to the Palm Court. And they gave me a title as the Legumier, which was just the vegetables, <laughs> you know. They didn't have me set up the plate with the vegetables, Legumier. and I would cook a, a seafood omelet, right? I just was really setting up the plates and getting the vegetables and stuff on it, right? So I did that, but I was right next to my good buddy. He was cooking on the broiler. And so we did that a long time. Which good buddy? Uh, David Wasser. I work with him right now mm -hmm. at, up at... Uh, I teach at North Seattle with him, and um, so that worked good for a while, but I really had a problem with them. <laughs> I just felt like hey. those guys who were working in the Palm Court was up to about $8. I was still at about five thirty-five, five seventy-five, and I talked to the chef, uh, the executive chef, Reiner Gruber. He would say, well, that's union pay. I said, well, yeah, well, I'm in the union everything, but, you know, you can pay me better. I'm not going to be here too long, right, right? Right, right? And he was, Joe, you just work. We'll take care of all that. And he was a big German guy, huge. I was, I was kind of was scared of that guy. He talk, <laughs> he kind of talked down to you, too. He you, you, he really would be. I come to find out later, he might have had a little problem with stuff, but. He just was under big pressure. He was running five or six restaurants in that hotel. He was under big pressure. Huh. I ran into him in life after he wasn't working for him. He had his own nice little right. restaurant called Reiner's. I don't know if he ever went there. No? But he was a whole different person. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. So uh, I eventually leave there. And uh, where do I go from there? I leave uh, the Weston, and I get a job at, oh, I get my first chef job out of the, from the Weston. I get hired on a place um, on First and Yesler, it's a place called the Washington Post. Okay. And um, it was a, a restaurant there, they sold breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but it was similar, it wasn't that style, but they, you could order anything, anytime. You can order dinner, breakfast, and lunch all on the same order, right? Mm -hmm. It was just, I, 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 we, I used to make fresh scones every day, make my mm -hmm. own desserts, cheesecake, chocolate, decadent, fresh pasta, carrot and spinach pasta. We make all of that stuff. Uh, the, the, actually, I got hired down there as a cook, and then the chef left, and I became the chef. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the guy who... Uh, was this chef, his name was Hugh Cole, and I called him Fine Tune Cuisine. His food was fine tuned. He he was upset if anybody ordered like a steak. He just he said they can go to the Sizzler. Right, right. I know we don't need to cook that. So he was so funny with meat. He really he just wasn't into it. He was into edible flowers and wild mushrooms, you know. Right, right. All kind of. He'd had this old guy come in. This young guy, Peter, would come in and he'd have the craziest looking mushrooms and all <laughs> kind of stuff, lobster mushroom, cauliflower oyster. He'd come in with all kind of flowers. And just To me, it was just so strange, but it was really nice. Mm -hmm. And um, on the, um, all the dishes, we'd use butter sauces where he didn't believe in no flour. So I learned to do real good butter sauces there with him. And that's where you reduce, uh, you saute whatever you have and hit it and then reduce it down till it's just getting ready to burn. It's so thick, whatever's left in there, just a minute to put a bunch of butter in there, <laughs> move it around, take it off the fire, and then it'll thicken up into a real rich, tasty sauce. Mm -hmm. And then I became the chef, and I stayed there probably. That place was leaving. They were going. The owners had something going on. I don't know what happened with that. 
It's a, that place is a session while it's a Chinese place now. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Do you, do you know where Michelli's is? Yeah. Tutorial Michelli? Yeah, yeah. Right across the alley. Okay, yeah, yeah. Where that session while place is down, kind of go downstairs. Mm -hmm. That was the Washington Post. Wow, okay. Okay. Okay, from there I think I end up getting hired at Ray's downtown. And, um, let's see, what year is this? Well, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> you know, for a while I was working at two or three spots, really. Then you're done with school by now. Yeah, so I, I was through with school and I was out in the world. Uh, what year did we start? We started a business in Cornish. That had to be. That had to be before some of that, just to get in the chronology, because there was a lot of spot. We opened a deli in Cornish Institute, me and uh, David Wasser. Okay. And uh, we worked it for two years somewhere in there. And um, we used to feed all the students, you know, to have the art and the dance. It was two buildings. We were doing a lot of things like quiche and making chili and mm -hmm. muffins and, you know, cookies. We were trying to make a living out of it. Right, right, right. right. And uh, so it was real interesting, and uh, doing catering from there, and uh, like I said, then we parted, and then I ended up at Ray's, I think, and uh, Ray's had a different way of cooking, just pulling it off the fire, really, with, with a fish, and uh, I know one night I was cooking, they had uh, all the governors come to, to Ray's, and uh, they wanted to find out why, uh, in most parts of the country, people's seafood uh, sales were going down. But in Seattle, and it was going off the chart, right? And Ray's was kind of at the, the forefront of that idea of those guys from Ray's. And it was just their method of timing, really. It really was huh. just pour the fish off, quick cooking it. Really cooking it like what would be equivalent in a steak to medium rare right, right. that's right. what you know and so it's there a lot and let the carryover heat finish it right was their thing wow, and okay. uh, just uh, and then the way they taught the uh, fishermen to, to handle the fish when they catch it yeah. don't beat it up so much treat it gentle and then you get more in the market per fish instead of just banging it around and the fish is bruised up and stuff mm -hmm. They really put a big area, and I think if they, from, from Ray's, they sold that back to the whole country. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So, that's something I raised. <laughs> when do I ever get in business? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a while. Okay, from, let's see, I get out of school and I graduate out of there in about 83, somewhere in there. And so, um, So Ray's, uh, I get hired from Ray's. I just a guy just come in and talk to me. He's going to open up a restaurant and catering business. And uh, it's a guy I had I have worked with in the past. You know, he'd have me. I'd make pate and homemade crackers and pork peppercorn pate and vegetable pate and stuff, and bring to him. And then we'd do catering jobs. He'd have me bring a couple items. And um, he was going to business. It was him and his wife, and they asked me to be the chef. So I helped to pick out equipment and we opened this place on 2nd and Jackson. It's still there today. It's called the Court in the Square, right? Okay. And they cater out of there. Huh. And um, so I'm down there now and uh, I really get to do a lot of catering there also. And, uh, and then I get to cook my food, whatever special I want to cook because we did a restaurant. And then in the evenings and weekends, we'd do catered events. We'd feed the people in the two buildings. So I really got to cook a lot of soups. I'd make two soups a day and roast fresh turkey, plus any kind of special. I when I really was able to cook my, whatever I wanted to cook. But they had one stipulation, which was good. It gave me a different slant. No grease and no salt. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no salt, no grease. If it's yeah. any kind of, no deep frying, I mean minimum grease like olive oil or something, but right. not much grease on anything. Wow. So, and, um, I mean, a lot of the stuff you had been cooking was 
more greasy. It's just more French grease, salty, you know. Yeah, yeah. Put salt in it, grease, you know, deep fry it, all kind of stuff. Right. So what did you make? Well, I would do the same. I did a lot of poaching. Like, I learned how to... Well, you know, I could, I could, at this time, I felt like there's nothing in the world I couldn't handle, right? Because I'm, char I'm charging up a big hill, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, okay, you know, I can just work with some different flavors, you know, herbs and mm -hmm. spices. And mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while I slip a little soy sauce or something, right? But, <laughs> but, but mostly uh, I would start with the turkeys. I learned to I start with, I roast those turkeys. And I would kind of cover them so they didn't really get brown on the outside. It would be white and steam, and I'd capture all that broth, right? I'd save that broth and reduce it, and a little pinch of that get with a lot of flavor. Mm. And then I'd take the carcass and make turkey stock, and I'm making soups out of that all the time. Soups of that or any kind of a seafood. I like to use clam broth, or, or people say don't use it, but I use salmon bones and make a quick start, even though a lot of people say it's too oily. Uh, it's, I think if you don't go long with it really quick, you know, let it simmer for maybe 15 minutes. Okay. And then take everything out and then reduce it a little bit. And uh, so, you know, a flavor building, I think back to the first place I worked, he, it was just older time. People don't even cook like that anymore. It's, it's like he would make his beef stock, he'd c cook them bones, and he'd put it in the oven with the tomato sauce and roast it, and then and then, uh, and then pour that liquid in there and put it in a pot and simmer it and skim it and, you know, just old time, not base. It was no base. He wouldn't use any kind of thing like beef base. A lot of places use beef base now, which is really salt. So it, it just helped me. All the things I went through helped me at this time. Yeah. And uh, I got to where I so really I'm could sorry, taste salt. You have to, because I don't know the stuff. The beef base is. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's kind of a mixture they make to uh, like supply a, like a bouillon to, to bouillon to replace beef stock. Okay. The broth, the natural broth, right off right. of the animals when you're cooking it. Right. And then. Uh, so people beef base. Started kind of yeah, like you could just take some and put it in hot water, right. and you get a, a, a taste out of it. Okay. So it's not just water. But you were doing the old-fashioned way of making right. stuff from the right. bones. Right. Okay. Right. And it's just it's a whole different taste. Yeah. Even though you can make stuff taste good both ways. Right. I, to this day, I use both ways uh -huh. because you don't. It's just a different time. You right, sometimes right. you don't. You're not able to make stuff. Right. 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 Yeah. You know they don't. Time is different. Yeah. So, uh, this restaurant is a, it was a real good concept of no grease, no salt. I got to where if I taste anything with salt in it, my lips would be so dried up. <laughs> I just couldn't, you know, I could taste salt. Oh, yeah. I just, it was, everything was salty. Yeah, yeah. Everything. So was it like they're kind of health foods? They're here? really they health. Were... They're so... <laughs> Penny is so thin and in such good shape, and was such a great baker and cook. She she could move. She could be dressed like she's going out to dinner and move around that kitchen. Don't get a spot even on her apron. She was so wow. neat and good, <laughs> and she did everything at the last minute. She was the lady that I uh, worked with, Penny, and she was a really good baker. You know, she didn't like to do huge things. She'd always do stuff you'd see maybe in a home, but she was able to do them at a, at a good rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I think I was, I, I worked with them good there. I worked there for a couple of years. But um, in fact, I've worked with them two or three times. I even there call me sometimes to come help them out when they have big events now. Oh, yeah. And, um, it's, I think I, it's, the place was kind of small. I'm, I'm big. I'm boisterous. I'm loud, and they liked me because I would, uh, you know, manage the crew, the people that work with. Them. I, I could manage them easy, right? Mm -hmm. And it'd free them up to do whatever they wanted to do. Right. And uh, but eventually, I think just me being in there, 
and she needed some more space. I, I started taking all the space from her, I think. <laughs> she couldn't hardly cook as, as well, I think, with me in there, even though it was a tremendous pressure off of them because they didn't have to do it. Now they're back in the kitchen and they have people, but I think they really like to be in the kitchen, but their business can't afford them to be in there really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we parted ways a couple times and uh, and then from there I go into business on my own. I decided, well, I could just work with some people for a while. And, I call myself a personal mediator, whatever that was. And what, wow, personal mediator. Yep, I had my, had my business cards. I had Joseph Bark on there. Personal mediator. So what was that? It was just my some term. A mediator, it know. just wasn't. A, I, I, I consider it now just an improper term for. Uh, I just called myself. I'm just going to be between. Whatever anybody need, I'm going to get in QR. If somebody needs labor, I'm going to find the oh, people. Okay. They need me to cater, I'll do that. They want to use my van to load it around. Whatever, I'm just going to work with everybody, and I'm just going to create some space for me here. Oh. I'm just trying to make a living and not standing up in the kitchen uh -huh. all the time. Actually, down, t down there, I started noticing my knees start hurting working in that kitchen down there. It was a... It was a concrete floors, you know, yeah. and, and then it just was a, it was hard to work down there. After yeah. a while, I realized, you know, it would beat me up, so I had to get away from down there. And uh, so I did, really. And uh, actually, I started cooking in a home in, in the central area. I was living in West, I was living on Queen Anne, actually, and I moved to, I moved to the central area. I picked a house that we rented. It was a it was a duplex, but the way it was set up, I could back my truck up by the back door, and there was a little spot back there. There was, I guess it would be like, they they probably was used for storage or something. But I was able to put a refrigerator in there, a couple okay. of refrigerators in there, and then it was, the next space was the kitchen. Okay. Right, and I was and I wanted to buy that and then move my family upstairs another part and I could have that whole level to work with, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. uh, and it was going good. The owners he turned around and didn't want to sell it after a while. So I was over there about two years, maybe a year and a half. And what made it all possible is uh, I eventually, uh, I got a client called the Rainier Rotary. Uh -huh. Right, the Rainier <laughs> Rotary. And uh, and I, I think my first year in business, I think I made fourteen thousand dollars, <laughs> right? And then I went up to I think to about forty thousand gross. This is gross. This is not net figures. This is I'm not making any money. This is gross. Right. And then I went up to eighty seven. And I had a couple of years around 120, 140. I went up to 180. Wow. A couple of years I went over 250, 250,000 gross. Wow. In uh, 88, let's see, 87, 88, and 89. I had huge years. And um, I mean, I had three vans, four vans rolling around Seattle. You see them all parked out there now, kind of casualties of them of the storm <laughs> and then uh, I got in, got in some personal stuff there with um, you know just getting divorced and from working on a lot of it I, I truly believe was just I'm working she's working you strange so that kind of broke me up a little bit I didn't want to cater at all <laughs> I don't want to cater for anybody I really, you know, it wasn't how I saw my life going at that time. So, click, cut it off. No. <laughs> you want to get some more tea, some hot water? I'm uh, sure. I think I got a little bit more in there. Okay. Well, you're right on the bad stuff now. I start crying. Oh. Um. <laughs> Where are we at? So you were, the Rainy Rotary was your first big regular I think line. so. It's a, And I've been with them for... Since 1990. Okay. I've been catering them since then. And then the Rainer Chamber mm -hmm. from the Rotary. Mm -hmm. Some of the members, in fact, uh, excuse me, uh, 
uh, not John DeFranco, but his dad. Did you know him? Lou DeFranco. Lou. Yeah. Yeah. He said, he's Joe, sweet. let me get you down there to the chamber. Man. We might want you to cater those lunches. He always tries to help. He's a so, good guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> I'm catering and now I'm back up to the school. It's a, it's a million twists and turns <laughs> in there, but that's... <laughs> So you're teaching now too? I'm, yeah, I'm a, teach, a teacher at North Seattle Community College mm -hmm. and cater. I'm up there four days a week. I'm a part-time teaching technician. Okay. Uh, the students at North Seattle, they go in the classroom in their first and second and third quarter. They go in the classroom and take it and they read the book and he show them everything. Then he sent them out to the kitchen so I could show them how to do it and then just work with them and they produce lunch and catered events mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right and i kind of direct them through there and allow them to do it uh -huh. don't do it for them <laughs> and uh we got some pretty good students coming out of there too yeah. i've been doing that probably close to two years mm -hmm. and uh but my heart is catering mm -hmm. out of all the styles of cooking I remember one time I just I, I really just envisioned being on the saute station. I just could just see myself cooking on the saute station with the flame jump. Mm. Then when I got it raised, I did that, and I mean they, those orders were rolling in so wild and crazy. And so I was able to do it. And then also when I was at um, the Washington Post, I got to do it. I just loved the saute. It would seem like the glory station, you know, you get to have all the fun, <laughs> you know, flipping stuff around, throwing it and banging it, the flames and just, you know, the sauces, it just was, uh, and I think you learn a lot, well, if you go through that station under pressure, you'll learn a lot about cooking, and so, and then after, you know, I did that, um, the catering became my passion, I just like, I like the, I like the concept of one of them on balls so I could be home like now talking to a lovely lady like you, <laughs> right? Right. Now that's, you can't beat that. Um, and then, uh, since I've been in business a long time now, uh, it's, I, I don't really have to worry the phone will ring, right? Right. right. The phone will ring, right? Right. So, I have to do some work though. I have, to, I have to get out and move around. I have to be seen. Yeah, yeah. It's a big part of mine is going around and see everybody, put the shelf stuff on and talk right. to everybody. Right. <laughs> it's a it's a large form of uh, marketing for me. Yeah, yeah. It's just people see me and knowing, hey, you know, after because of because of time I think, working yeah. over time. Well it seems like the other thing about catering is you're like you're always there at somebody's big special mm -hmm. day, you know, I mean, it, it's that part of it, do you feel like you're... No, it's, it's the gratification. You get, uh, I mean, you're around good stuff, having the weddings and right. some kind of good events, good and bad, yeah. you know, a lot of funerals and stuff too, but when you get that, the good stuff, you get the pat on the back instantly mm -hmm. in catering, mm -hmm. if you do something. Right, we loved it or we didn't, right? right. But most of the time, you know, they love it. Right. And so you they compliment you and you know, it's just um, uh, it's just that's gotta be it's great for your ego so much they love what you do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Well, uh, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> I have to get another tape out, this one's about to run out. Yeah. So, um I was gonna ask you whoops. So when you were talking about chopping up all that lettuce and everything? Making green salad and stuff like that. Right. I was wondering, like, do they ever use um, Cuisinart's or, I mean... Well, a food processor yeah. is it's, it's used for different... I use a food processor and, you know, the restaurants have a huge window, you know, it's not the one like in the West and it's a, they call it a tilting, um, what is it called to say? tilting vertical mixer, right? It has a big gigantic blade in it. It's oh, a whole yeah. probably about five gallons, right? Wow. And it's a big <laughs> long blade in there, right? Just the same, just like the big one that fits in there, but you know it screws on. Yeah. 
and you could do huge stuff in there, right? Mm -hmm. you, uh, you put your onions in there, you know, you put five pounds in there, something to pure yeah. them up, like making dressings. Uh -huh. I like to use food processors for dressing and cold sauces, and mm -hmm. any kind of solid dressing. That's what I think you could knocks it out for you. Yeah, but the knife is still... But the knife, to cut, you had to use a knife to cut stuff with. I mean, there's every tool in the world, and for some jobs, you need to use them. I mean, attachments for your mixer, the whole board mixer. You can put a slice of putting potatoes or something, but nothing gives you the the finish of a, of a cut that, you know, you make with your knife.